Okay. Um, so I think we'll get started. Um, thank you so much to everyone for, for coming. Um, welcome to the Wisconsin Maritime Museum. My name is Caroline Deemer and I'm the programming coordinator here. I'm so excited to welcome you all to this month's Think and Drink. Um, so Think and Drinks, if you guys don't know, are a free monthly speaker series that happens on the first Thursday evening of every month. Um, so this year, this, this talk is actually going to be the last one of this theme, um, but this year is a celebration of the USS Cobia's 80th launch anniversary. So we have held a year of free talks focused on often untold stories from World War II. Um, and uh, so we're going to have uh, a, ne a new uh, theme next year, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end. Um, but I would like to thank our sponsor, the Wisconsin Humanities Council. The Wisconsin Humanities Council is the reason why we're able to have this talk be free tonight. Um, and the Wisconsin Humanities Council strengthens our democracy through cultural programs that build connections and understanding between people of all backgrounds and beliefs throughout the state. Um, and I am just super excited about tonight's talk. Um, tonight we have Annie Wright Nunn. I hope we got it. Excellent. Um, and she is from the National Park Service's Submerged Resources, and she's going to be talking to us about the Wounded Veterans and Parks Program. So uh, I'll let Annie take it away. All right. Let me um, get this presentation up here. Okay. Are you looking at just the PowerPoint? Uh, no. No. Have that in there. If you share your screen. Oh, let's see. Okay. What about now? There you go. There you go. Yep. Good? You're all good now. Yep. Wonderful. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for having me give a presentation tonight. Um, my name is Annie Wright Nunn, and I am an underwater archaeologist for the National Park Service Submerged Resources Center. Um, and I'm going to speak to, with you tonight about our work at Pearl Harbor National Memorial and the ongoing science, as well as our Wounded Veterans and Parks Volunteer Program, which um, have a pretty strong connection between the two. So the Submerged Resources Center is an office of the National Park Service that serves all underwater needs of national parks. Um, it's based of all places in Denver, Colorado, which you're probably thinking is a strange place for a marine and ocean sciences center. Um, but it's actually because we're a national program of the NPS and there is a park service headquarters that we're housed within um, here in Colorado. The SRC serves national parks nationwide and even in some territories like Guam. So um, being a little more centrally located allows us to access quite a few regions of the Park Service, including in the Pacific, um, such as at Pearl Harbor National Memorial. Um, the SRC was founded in the 1980s as part of what was originally called the National Reservoir Inundation Study, um, which began in New Mexico. So that was how we ended up out west. Um, and the purpose of that was to document archaeological sites that were previously on land, but when the government began to dam up all the western rivers, like the Colorado River, they needed an inventory of what cultural sites were now underwater. And so the predecessor of the SRC, which was called the Submerged Cultural Resources Unit, was formed um, to complete that work and thus began underwater archaeology and the Park Service. Um, and for a long time, that program was based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, its crew was eventually changed to become a center that serviced all national parks with water resources, and we were relocated to Denver. There are 413 units of the Park Service around the United States, and those include, you know, the official national parks such as Yosemite, Yellowstone, those big famous big name parks, as well as national historic parks, national recreation areas, national seashores, et cetera. Um, and of these 413, 148 of them have pretty significant water resources, which includes about 5 million submerged acres of both ocean and lake bottom, 70,000 miles of rivers, 5,000 miles of coastline, and 27 dive teams across the Park Service with about 250 total divers. Most of those divers um, have diving as a collateral duty, meaning they have primary, uh, another primary job in the park, such as a law enforcement officer who also participates in diving on an as-needed basis. 
So these park dive teams aren't always out diving for science every day. Um, and so the SRC serves as a more specialized team that can provide very specific scientific underwater needs that focus um, primarily on cultural resources. So we are a team of eight. We have um, five underwater archeologists, an underwater photographer, a dive operations specialist, and an admin assistant. Um, we do some natural resources work as well, but that's usually in partnership with other science programs of the NPS. As, like I mentioned, our team um, is still largely made up of underwater archeologists. Um, so our mission is to provide direct project support to national parks responsible for the stewardship of submerged resources and to enhance and facilitate public appreciation, access, understanding, and preservation of these resources, which is by design a very broad mission statement. So we do a lot of different kinds of underwater work um, with the primary job of doing underwater archaeology in parks, um, of which a park that we work a lot at is Pearl Harbor National Memorial as one of the most significant underwater archaeological sites in our nation's history. Pearl Harbor National Memorial, which is the site of USS Arizona, has had um, a few iterations and different names over the years. It was initially called the USS Arizona Memorial, which was dedicated on Memorial Day of 1962 to commemorate the attack on Pearl Harbor and the people who died defending it. Um, and beginning in 1980, the National Park Service began operating the memorial and the visitor center to ensure the preservation and an interpretation of the tangible historical resources associated with the attack, though the harbor still is an active military base and owned by the US Navy. So um, if you've ever visited, you know that there are areas of the harbor that tourists are not allowed. Um, in 1989, the Arizona, the ship itself, not just the memorial, um, was designated as a national historic landmark. But in 2008, Pearl Harbor was combined with several other World War II related historical sites to become what was known as World War II Valor in the Pacific National Monument, which I've always thought is a pretty cool name um, and included other World War II sites across the Pacific, including this B-24 at Atka Island in Alaska. Um, but the memorial was separated from the other monuments again in 2019 and now remains Pearl Harbor National Memorial. Um, the park unit is more than just USS Arizona. It also includes the physical memorial itself, which you can see here in this photo. Um, the memorial is obviously the white structure laid over the sunken Arizona. You'd be surprised the number of people that we have that visit this park that don't realize that the Arizona is actually still underneath the memorial. So uh, this is a pretty cool view, I think. Um, the memorial also includes the USS Utah and its associated memorial, the USS Oklahoma Memorial, um, six Chief Petty Officer bungalows on Ford Island and Mooring Keys F6, F7, and F8, which formed part of Battleship Row and the Visitor Center. 82 years ago today, the first Japanese dive bomber plane appeared over Pearl Harbor at 7.55 a.m. It was part of the first wave of nearly 200 planes, which included torpedo planes, bombers, and fighter planes. By 810, Pearl Harbor's airfields, oops, sorry. <laughs> um, Pearl Harbor's air, airfields went under attack by 810 a.m. Um, US planes were packed tightly together at the Naval Air Station on Ford Island, Wheeler, and Hickam fields there. And the Japanese quickly destroyed or damaged um, two thirds of the American aircraft at Pearl Harbor by strafing the airfields and left only 43 total aircraft fit for flying. Um, at the same time as the attack on the airfields, Japanese bombers targeted Battleship Row where the Arizona was moored. The time of the attack Sunday morning was actually strategic as many service members were off duty and wouldn't be present and ready to respond to an attack. And the battleships obviously made large and easy targets for the bombers um, and most of the damage to the, to the ships occurred during the first 30 minutes. The West Virginia sank and settled on an even keel or right side up. Um, the Oklahoma, which was hit by four torpedoes in five minutes, rolled completely over and left the bottom of the ship and the propeller sticking up out of the water. Um, the California and the Utah sank quickly, and almost all ships in the harbor were damaged in some way. The second wave of the attack began at 8.50 a.m., so pretty quickly after. The USS Nevada, which you can see here, was stationed at the end of Battleship Row, and while it was hit by a torpedo during the first wave of the attack, its position at the end of the row actually allowed for a little more maneuverability than the other battleships had, 
So it was getting underway when the second wave of the attack began, but it was hit by seven bombs and then grounded in the channel. Um, other battleships damaged during the attack included the USS Pennsylvania, which was bombed and set on fire, and the destroyer USS Shaw, which was split in half by an explosion. The Arizona, as we know, was most famously hit during the attack. Um, the ship was moored inboard of a, the repair vessel, which um, was the Vestal, um, when the attack began, and 10 Japanese Kate torpedo bombers first attacked the ship and dropped four bombs on it just after 8 a.m. Three of the bombs only caused minor damage, but the fourth bomb that plunged um, down several decks is believed to have caused the most damage. There's some historical and scientific debate about what happened next. Um, and there's frequent report that this bomb went down the stack or turret of the Arizona and ignited the magazine, um, though there's actually little evidence of an explosion in that area. Most attack related damage is in the bow area, which supports um, a little bit of a contention that the ship was sunk by a bomb or torpedo that detonated the forward magazine. Um, regardless of what caused it, the resulting explosion was enormous, as you can see here, um, and collapsed to the decks of the ship. The sides were blown out of the turrets and conning tower and the superstructure of the ship dropped into the hull and it burned for more than two days straight. The Japanese withdrew by 9 a.m. inflicting a huge amount of damage in just over an hour. And in total, 2,403 U.S. personnel were killed, which included 68 civilians. 19 U.S. Navy ships were damaged or destroyed, eight of which were battleships. Thankfully, three U.S. aircraft carriers um, of the Pacific Fleet were actually out at sea on training maneuvers and avoided attack. Um, and approximately half of those that died in the attack were crew members of the Arizona. So thus began extensive repairs and salvage of the ships lost at Pearl Harbor. Some repair times lasted all the way into 1944, but a great deal of salvage was completed by February 1942, just a few months later. Um, and the Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Tennessee battleships, the cruisers Honolulu, Helena, and Raleigh, and the destroyers Helm and Shaw, as well as a seaplane tender and a floating dry dock were repaired and returned to service, or at least floatable and maneuverable, um, as some were sent back to the mainland U.S. for final repairs. Nine other ships were severely damaged or sunk and required extensive work to begin any kind of repairs. Um, for example, the destroyers Cassin and Downs were totally stripped of, of weapons, machinery, and equipment, and then sent to California, and then those items were installed on completely new hulls, um, only after which point the ships could be returned to service. Oops, sorry. Um, divers and salvage crews began working on the Arizona uh, within a week after the attack. Um, the teams discovered that the aft part of the ship, or the rear part of the ship, extending from where the deck had broken to the stern, was actually relatively intact. Um, and that allowed for salvage teams to remove things like safes, valuables, um, and documents of sensitive nature that would have been on board. And divers also assessed the feasibility of raising the ship. One such strategy was to build a coffer dam around the ship, which is a temporary barrier um, put up that water can be pumped out of. Here's an image um, if you've never heard of one before. And unfortunately, in the case of the Arizona, the harbor's coral bottom was found to be um, too porous and wouldn't allow for the construction of one. And so eventually the idea of full salvage was scrapped. So divers trained specifically in the removal of ordnance and weapons began wow. removing ammunition and projectiles in May um, of 42. Um, and guns and other machinery were stripped for use on other ships or stations. Um, divers found that the interior of the, interior of the Arizona had been severely damaged um, by the explosion near the magazine, as we talked about. And the furthest that they could move toward the bow of the ship was on the third deck, where the second sloped um, into the third deck, which you can see. Um, they also found that gun turrets one and two had fallen between 20 and 28 feet, which indicated a collapse of the ship supporting structure. So you can really see how 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 much this midships area fell into the decks below it. Um, in mid-1942, the foremast and the main mast of the Arizona were cut away and removed um, along with the stern aircraft or stern aircraft crane and the conning tower. Um, the Navy gave uh, number three and four gun turrets to the Army for use as coastal defense guns, um, which those were installed at um, Makapu Head at Kaneohe, also known as Battery Pennsylvania, and at Electric Hill on the western shore of Oahu. 
Um, only the installation at Battery, Pennsylvania was completed, and a test fire of the guns took place only four days before the surrender of Japan. Um, so you could see how long those took to be installed. Both sites are unfortunately now abandoned, and um, sadly the guns were um, scrapped and cut up and removed um, after the war ended. So those uh, guns in the Arizona are, are now lost. Um, so on December 1st, 1942, almost a whole year later, the Arizona was finally struck from the books of U.S. Navy commissioned ships, um, you know, fully decided that it was not salvageable. And by October 1943, the last of the salvage work was completed um, when this ship was stripped down to the main deck with no superstructure as it remains today, as you saw in some of those pictures. Um, the final alteration to the deck was made in 1961 when the memorial was placed over the wreck. Um, a section of the deck uh, that rested over the midship's galley was cut away to place the memorial, um, which exposed um, artifacts. And so artifacts in the galley are, are now spread over the deck. Um, and we have found such items as bowls, plates, silverware, and even that tiled floor that you can see in the picture. I also think that if you can see my mouse, this tiny little white bowl right here is, is very similar to the kind used here. So it's always interesting to see those artifacts and historic as well. So a question we often get, and one that was asked after the attack as well is, why were the dead not removed during these salvage efforts? Initially, crews removed the remains of about 105 service members, um, which I will talk about more in a bit. But because the hull of the ship was deemed unraisable, the rest of the dead were left on the ship. And while it's sad, the Navy's priority at the time was the salvage of repairable ships, not the recovery of remains. Um, and the bodies consequently deteriorated past the point of being identifiable. And at the time, forensic techniques for identifying human remains were not available. And so the U.S. Navy considered them buried at sea. Scientific study of the Arizona began in the 1980s with Project Seamark, which was a partnership between the National Park Service Submerged Cultural Resources Unit, the Memorial, and the Navy. Um, Navy divers assisted NPS diving archaeologists with the initial underwater assessments and mapping of the Arizona. And the team produced these incredibly detailed, hand-drawn maps of the site. So this image is just the bow section. So you can see how much work went into producing this as every artifact and piece of the ship had to be hand measured underwater and then reproduced to scale on land. Beyond the initial mapping, um, the team also conducted a corrosion and biofouling. And if there are any biologists in the audience, I really apologize for that term. Um, underwater archaeology has since moved away from calling growth on archaeological sites biofouling. Um, so forgive me for the 1980s. But um, conducted a biofouling analysis um, to try to understand if and how quickly the ship was deteriorating. So the team hypothesized that the growth of organisms like sponges, corals, reduced the corrosion rate as it formed a protective layer over the ship. See, biofiling, actually a good thing. Um, with the exception of the interior of the ship, um, where the lack of light might prohibit extensive growth and the corrosion rate uh, might be higher than the exterior, or uh, sorry, less, lesser than the exterior of the ship. Um, they also hypothesized that any whole components or artifacts buried in silt would exhibit um, an even lesser rate of corrosion. And data was collected for this study by placing these data collection stations, which you can see here, um, on various areas on the hull. So all science has been done on the outside. Um, to measure the fouling thickness, they drove a steel rod through the fouling or the organism crust until they hit a solid substrate. Um, and then the thickness was reported as two values, the first being the thickness of hard and dense, generally dead uh, biofoul, and the second is the estimated average maximum thickness of, of living fouling. So estimates were also made of percent coverage or presence absence of um, easily identified organisms such as like mollusks, oysters, tube worms, sponges, algae, those kinds of things. A well-known impact of the attack is the continuously leaking oil from the ship that was caused by the explosion. Um, and this was one of the first scientific undertakings in the study of the ship. So the day before the attack, the ship had taken on a full load of fuel, nearly 1.5 million gallons um, in preparation for a scheduled steam to the mainland. Um, and an estimated 500,000 gallons currently remains in the ship. 
And the ship spills approximately nine quarts of oil into the harbor every day in the form of these tiny jelly bean sized bubbles of oil um, that come out of the ship every 20 seconds or go every 20 seconds or so. Um, when these bubbles hit the surface, the oil disperses and creates this constant oil slick over the site, which you can see here. So this much oil really just comes from one or two bubbles. Um, I will say that this image is a little misleading. It doesn't usually come out this quickly. There's usually only one um, bubble at a time um, in my experience that I've seen. So I'm not sure what happened here, um, but it's a pretty neat image of the oil trickling out. So as you can imagine, it's been a hotly debated issue for many years, um, some arguing that the oil should be pumped out to avoid the chance of a catastrophic oil spill. However, the NPS stance is that the oil should remain as is for a couple of reasons. Um, first, the archaeological analysis indicates that the remaining 500,000 gallons of oil may actually be partially supporting the structure of the ship. Um, and therefore, if the oils are moved, the remaining ship structure could collapse. Um, and obviously, additionally, the removal of the oil would disturb the site. As we're aware, it's a very significant war grave, and we try to leave it as intact as possible. Um, so you can see here, highlighted in red, are all of these oil bunker locations. Um, we're not sure, you know, you know, which ones are full still, which ones are not. Um, but it's a pretty, pretty significant um, amount, as you can see. So the team found that corrosion was occurring more rapidly on the ship in depths of six feet and less. So these areas up here, uh, meaning that the deeper parts of the ship were less corroded um, than those that are more exposed to sunlight and the organisms that require sunlight to survive. So the corrosion damage, not significant in the interior of the ship for the same reasons. Um, and areas that were sedimented were also more protected than exposed areas. Um, and we continue to monitor these types of information today. So in 2018, after a great deal of debate and consideration of the ethics, Pearl Harbor National Memorial and um, the SRC used an ROV to explore the interior areas of the ship. An ROV was chosen uh, rather than allowing divers to penetrate the ship um, in respect for, for those that lost their lives. Like I said, we, we really try to maintain the integrity of the ship as a war grave at all times. So the team spent um, the week before the ROV work locating access points on the ship to the interior um, and determining which of the hatches um, had likely not had, um, you know, too much, too much damage. Um, no human eyes had seen inside of the ship since December 7th. And so it was unclear, especially after salvage, um, what areas of the ship would still be accessible. Um, now I'm not going to video you to death, but I do want to show you some of the interior footage. Can you guys hear this okay? Yes. Okay. We really didn't have the capacity to do the scientific sampling that we wanted in the first expedition. So we brought the team back together several months later with the same ROV, but this time the 11th hour had some sampling technology that was applied to the unit itself. A visual survey is good, but really the empirical data of corrosion potential and water sampling, in addition to some sediment and some microbiological analysis was really what we needed to kind of round out the science. Yeah, we're back. Good job. And the idea was to take all of these samples and send them out to experts in the field. We have a, a microbiologist who works with us at Harvard University. I mean, we know from our research, in right conditions, there's a whole community of microorganisms that can corrode metal. And the question we've always asked was, are the conditions right and are the microorganisms there to corrode the fuel? Is that the door? Is that yeah, your door? That's the door. Yeah, so that might be a door into the back closet. So the first area that we really wanted to look at was in the third deck. I had to flip it three times just in case. I didn't see an air bubble. Opening. So. Rotating. 
The third deck doesn't have exchange of oxygen or seawater from the surrounding Pearl Harbor. We knew from the environmental probe that basically there was low dissolved oxygen, but we also wanted to see the chemical makeup of that area as well. Closing. Well, that'll give us some keys to <coughs> the oil bunkers, which were lower in the ship, deeper in the ship. So the third deck really is an area that we believe tells us the story of what's further down within the ship. cabins that we went into that we had not access during the initial visual search of the ship. So we went into those just to see if they were any different. And also we wanted to take a sample where, where the sediment had been stirred up from previous ROV operations. to see up until that point because i think it's really cool to see some of the very human artifacts like the bed we just saw um there's also um in one of the officers cabins on one of the top decks um just from the outside of the ship underwater you can see looking in a jacket hanging in an open closet um you can see it from the porthole which is also a really kind of interesting artifact that drives home the you know the human loss on that day um, if you're interested in watching more of this video of the ROV exploration, um, it's on the SRC Vimeo account, um, and I have a link to that on the last slide. So if we do questions at the end, I'll leave that link up. Um, you can go back and watch more later. So really cool stuff in there. All right, I'm going to change gears um, and tell you a little bit about our Wounded Veterans at Parks program, um, which has been assisting us with all of this science and data collection on the Arizona. Um, there are several underwater archaeology programs that have been using veteran volunteers in recent years, um, of which the SRC is one. And um, there's been a lot of recent research that's shown the both the psychological and the physiological benefits of participation in outdoor activities, including scuba diving, um, in connection with peer support groups for veterans with service-related injuries. There are a few veteran organizations that are scuba-focused or that offer scuba programs as a form of therapy and camaraderie. And we work with several. These include um, the WAVES Project, which stands for Wounded American Veterans Experience Scuba Project, the Task Force Dagger Special Operations Foundation, and the Paralyzed Veterans of America. Um, this all started with the thought that diving as a form of sightseeing can be rewarding in and of itself. Um, but scientific diving and archaeological diving also taps into that mission-oriented, purpose-driven aspects of the military experience that, that many veter veterans miss after leaving active duty. Um, so the hope and their participation in NPS dive projects is that we can provide an opportunity to participate in a purpose-driven mission while doing so in a therapeutic setting. So the WAVES project is fully scuba-focused. They offer dive training as well as recreational and volunteer opportunities on top of camaraderie and purpose um, to their veteran participants um, with the goal of using scuba to rehabilitate various injuries such as amputations, post-traumatic post stress, and traumatic brain injuries. So we've worked with veterans with all of those issues. Um, Paralyzed Veterans of America supports uh, medical research and needs of veterans in general, with a speckle, special focus on those with um, spinal cord injuries, uh, which which is a scuba is a great option for that because of the weightlessness and, and rehabilitative um, effects. So PVA began incorporating dive training into their programming, um, and we work with a lot of wheelchair bound veterans with them and who use their arms and hands instead of legs to get around in the water. It's very impressive. <laughs> 
Task Force Dagger Foundation um, assists wounded, ill, or injured U.S. Special Operations Command members and their families um, on, on all kinds of issues. So they respond to urgent needs such as family and medical emergencies, but they also conduct rehabilitative adaptive events, as they call them, um, and this includes scuba events. So DFD began incorporating dive training and eventually joined forces actually with East Carolina University first um, to provide some archaeological diving opportunities. And the Park Service sort of piggybacked off of that and began offering opportunities as well. So SRC began working with these groups in 2016. And the first project um, that we had them helping out with dive ops was at Lake Mojave, which is part of Lake Mead National Recreation Area. Um, the veteran divers were trained by NPS archaeologists in underwater mapping and scientific diving skills, and then the following year um, applied what they learned to assist us with mapping the site of the Lake Mead aggregate plant, which was actually the facility used to make um, concrete aggregate for the construction of the Hoover Dam. And um, the ag plant is, well, it, it depends <laughs> on the day, but it's about 80 feet under Lake Mead. Um, as I'm sure you guys know, like me, water levels change a lot depending on the, the current situation. Um, and this became a yearly project for a while um, until the mapping of the site was complete. And in 2018, we had veteran volunteers join the team at Pearl Harbor for the first time, um, using all veterans from Paralyzed Veterans of America. And so the primary objective was to design, construct, and deploy um, an apparatus that was to collect um, those oil bubbles leaking from Arizona to continue the monitoring efforts. So they constructed these subsurface oil tents on the ship's deck. And, you know, I think I meant to put a picture in here of them and I forgot, so I apologize for that. Um, but they were designed to cover the surface area of a deck hatch and they acted as like an inverted funnel and the directed uh, it like directed floating oil droplets into a collection jar that was like suspended at the top of the tent. Um, and despite some challenges, uh, including the water depth, um, the tents, so the tents couldn't slope very much when it was shallow. Um, and also the material ended up being a little bit oil resistant, um, but it, it significantly improved the methodology for, for collecting oil for future research. Um, and PBA is continuing to help us with that. So. Um, in addition to recurring projects at Lake Mead and Pearl Harbor, um, we've had veterans with service-connected disabilities contribute to projects at Dry Tortugas National Park in South Florida, Channel Islands National Park in California, Isle Royale in Michigan, and also this summer for the first time at War in the Pacific National Historical Park in Guam. And we also host a yearly women veterans only um, marine debris cleanup at Biscay National Park, which has been super successful. Last year, um, we collected a little over two tons of trash from park waters in a week, which is really exciting. You can see some pictures of that cleanup here. Um, we've also had veterans assist us with um, other types of archaeological mapping, maintenance work and, and buoy placement, um, coral nursery maintenance, and even some invasive lionfish removal. And at this moment today, there are several veterans from PBA working with SRC staff at Pearl Harbor um, who are there for the commemoration services um, and continuing with the research that we just talked about. So they came out to our office in Denver uh, last week before traveling to Hawaii and, and got the really cool opportunity um, to conduct their dive training at the Denver Aquarium, which is what's going on here, um, like in the shark tank, which is kind of cool. <laughs> Um, and uh, then you can see them working here on the Arizona. This was just taken a couple days ago. So, um, We also have some projects on the Arizona that's completed um, by just our staff and park staff. And I'll tell you a little about those. Um, one of the primary ones is a 3D recording project. So the SRC is home to a system called C-Array, which you can see here in this picture, um, that we use to collect data for photogrammetry models. So photogrammetry, if you're unfamiliar, it's a method for creating 3D models of an object using still photographs. So in each of these blue canisters is a camera. Um, so we've got a pretty robust photogrammetry program here. This system was an in-house invention and um, not that I'm biased, it's one of the best underwater data collection systems in the world. So we're able to create 3D models with CRA of up to several acres of seafloor at a time. Um, and we've conducted some analysis that indicates on average our models are accurate to within two centimeters, which 
I think it's pretty good for several acres. So um, we use it for a number of purposes, including coral survey. Um, which we use to look for and track the progress of coral disease in parks, but also for shipwreck documentation, which is what's going on here. Um, this model here is a shipwreck at Isle Royal National Park. It's the SS America. Oh, sorry. Don't want you to see that one just yet. Let's try this again. Um, so this site would take weeks and weeks to map by hand, um, which it did back in the 80s and 90s. But you can see from just how much the you know the level of detail that's recorded here. And um, this was actually all collected in one long dive, so like a four-hour dive to collect all of this data. Um, and we're working on collecting this data for Arizona. There's a few more challenges um, there, including the water clarity. This is beautiful, crystal clear water, Isle Royal National Park. So it's just a little more slow going. Um, uh, in, in Pearl Harbor. So I'll move on and show you. So um, this is the bow section of the Arizona. It's the only section we have complete just yet. Um, and in a second, I'll show you, there'll be blue squares that pop up. There they are. Um, and, and each of these blue squares is an individual photograph. So you can kind of see the path that the diver swam with the camera system over back and forth, back and forth and across um, to kind of create this grid pattern that, that captures every every angle of the ship and then stitches those still photographs together into a 3D model. So once the other sections are recorded, we'll stitch it all together and then it'll be a, a you know 3D extremely accurate model of, of every artifact on the ship. don't think we'll be able to see it in this flyover, but there is um, a shoe located on the deck up here. I think over kind of in this area that's off screen right now. Um, it's believed that it's actually a, like a fire boot, um, not like someone's shoe that they lost that day, but like a pair of, of boots that were on um, the deck that, you know, you could put on if you were going to fight a fire. Um, but still pretty impactful to see things like like shoes and jackets and the bed that we saw earlier. All right. So other ongoing science um, on the Arizona or rather related to the Arizona is uh, it's closely associated with the idea that we talked about earlier of the Arizona as a war grave. So there is an agency within the Department of Defense called DPAA um, or the Department of Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, kind of a mouthful. Um, and their mission is to recover American military personnel who were killed in action or died as a prisoner of war and whose remains were never returned home. And while they conduct missions all over the world to relocate the remains of some KIA service members, um, they've been involved with identifying some casualties of Pearl Harbor as well. Um, and as we know, there was not a widespread effort to recover the remains of those killed aboard Arizona, but um, some remains were recovered intermittently during salvage. Um, and after World War II, the American Graves Registration Service, which was the predecessor of DPAA, um, was assigned the task of recovering and identifying remains from the Pacific War specifically. Um, and in 1947, the Grave Registration Service exhumed approximately 170 sets of remains um, from cemeteries in Hawaii that were tentatively associated with Arizona and transferred them to identification lab. Um, and the team worked to confirm the identities of the remains who were buried with a, with a name. So, you know, they knew that the person who had died and then to identify those who were buried as unknown. Um, and over 100 crew members of the Arizona were identified this way. The remaining sets of remains were declared non-recoverable and were reburied at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific, which you can see here. But then in 2015, a memorandum was issued to make an effort to identify um, these sets of remains as forensic science and DNA, DNA identification methodologies have made leaps and bounds since the 40s, as you can imagine. Um, so DPA must first collect the records of potentially unknown crew members of the Arizona and then collect DNA samples from known close family members in order to make a positive ID for those sets of remains. So it's a long and arduous task, um, 
but they're well on their way to identifying um, sets of remains. Um, and they're they're collecting DNA samples. So if you or someone you know um, is a as a close relative, I think like niece or nephew is about as far as you can get, and still have an accurate DNA sample. Um, so they're collecting they're collecting those. Um, finally, the SRC also helps with the interment of remains on the Arizona alongside U.S. Navy divers, which you can see here. So survivors of the attack then went on to fight in the war, survived, lived their lives, may choose um, to be cremated and then laid to rest with their shipmates. So of the 334 survivors from Arizona, there were 45 crew members um, who, who again chose the Arizona as their final resting place. So each time someone's chosen this, their remains are cremated um, and brought to Pearl Harbor where a service is conducted that includes a rifle salute and flag presentation, and then the remains are transferred um, from Park Service divers to Navy divers, who then place the urns into the well of Barbat number four. Um, so these interments are really the only time that any person enters the ship at all, and it's just barely in to tuck those remains away. They're all kind of placed in the same place. Um, and yeah, just you know, done done in respect for the ship as a war grave. All right, that is all I've got um, questions. And then also here is the link that you can find um, the videos that I was talking about, as well as um, you know more, more materials, publications, journal articles, those kinds of things. So nps.gov slash submerged. Okay. And do we have any questions? What was the depth of the water? What was the depth of the water yeah. for you? Where the Arizona sunk? Where the Arizona sunk? Where's the depth of the? What is the depth of the water? Um, it's actually not that deep. So the the bottom, like the very bottom, sits in about like thirty five feet of water, and you can see, um, standing on the memorial, I mean, you can see about between three to six feet that first deck. So it's pretty shallow. Did they have any survivors after the ship went down that were still tapping on the hull? Yeah, that is um, a very sad story that um, if there's a couple of books written about the salvage divers experience and they do talk about hearing um, you know people who are still alive and um, yeah things like tapping um, but they were unable to to retrieve those men in those cases, which is just horrible. Yes. Yeah, a uh, question from YouTube here. Uh, what is a more modern term for the bio bowling that you <laughs> um, we <laughs> We do um, a, a number of, of different terms for it. There's a lot of studies that have been going on actually about um, like sponges and how much they love shipwrecks. Um, and so we don't call it biofouling, but um, we, we just call it growth really, um, kind of like a non-derogatory <laughs> term. <laughs> or not with such a bad connotation. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, that's it. Well, please, everyone, join me in thanking Annie for her excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Annie. It was so interesting. Um, and we really, really appreciate you sharing all of that. Um, thank you again to everyone who came. If you enjoyed this presentation, um, uh, well, first off, I have some good news. It is continuing next year. <laughs> um, so we do have um, more Think and Drinks coming. I will say, I will shout out, we have one event coming up that's uh, before our next Think and Drink on uh, December 30th. We're having a free film screening of the movie Wind Shipped. Uh, no, Wind, yeah, Wind Shipped, um, which is about a, a schooner that is sustainably um, moving cargo on the Hudson River. Um, so that should be really cool. The One of the people who works on the winch, um, the Apollina is going to be here. He's a Manitowoc native. Yes, Stan. How long do we think the structures, though, to stay 
intact with the growth going on before it collapses in on the side. Um, so uh, how long, how long for you, Annie, how long um, do you think this, the, do we think that the structure is going to last? That's a great question. The current estimate is about 200 years. Excellent. Um, okay. Are there any other questions? Happy to have Annie answer many more. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, so next year, Think and Drink is not going to be about interesting stories from World War II, though there will definitely still be some of those sprinkled in. Um, next year, our theme is going to be about great women of the Great Lakes and beyond. So we're going to be talking about um, women's contribution to maritime history. Um, so we'll be talking about stories from World War II. We'll be talking from other time periods. We'll be talking about modern people as well. It should be super fun. Our next talk is going to be on January 4th, and we're going to continue the World War II theme a little bit with um, waves and spars, so the women of the Navy and the Coast Guard in World War II. So that should be really fun. If you guys enjoy this program and like it, um, please consider supporting. Um, supporting can come in the form of donations, uh, becoming a member, or just telling your friends and family about this program. I really appreciate everyone who's come out and supported us this year, and I really want to to continue doing these awesome talks and bringing awesome people like Annie. So yeah, thank you so much for coming and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Oh yeah. <laughs> Bye, Annie. Bye. <laughs>